So let's go to Philippians 4. And I promise I will not be long, just a, a brief thought this morning. And uh, in verses 6 through verse number 9. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9. The Bible says uh, this. He says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. So he says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. And then he goes on and he talks about, in every situation, pray. And notice what he says. He says in verse 7 that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will, will guard your hearts. It will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren... Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just and, and pure, and things that are lovely, whatever things are of a, a good report, if there be any virtue, notice, if there be anything to, be, uh, to praise over, anything to praise, think on these things. These are the things you need to think on. He says, then those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Now notice, and the God of peace shall be with you. We're going to see here that this phrase, this idea of the, the, the peace of God will be with you. He gives us some insight. Paul gives us some, some, some uh, instruction on how to have joy. How to have joy in any circumstance. We're going to kind of look at that for a few moments this morning. So let's have a word of prayer. We'll pray over some of these requests that we mentioned and we'll get right into the word. Let's pray. Lord. If you study the book of Philippians, you will find that the theme of the book of Philippians is this. Joy. Having joy. The word joy is used over and over and over again in the book of Philippians. Another phrase that you'll find, in fact, it's used two or three times just in the three verses that we read, is he talks about the peace of God. That you'll have this peace of God in any circumstance and situation. Now, it would be easy for us to say that, you know what, well, that's easy for Paul. Paul was an apostle. Paul was trained by Jesus Christ. If you study the scriptures, you'll find that Paul uh, was an apostle because he trained out in the desert of Arabia that Jesus himself trained him for three years. The Bible says that Paul, when he was converted, he did not uh, study with, with, with men, but he went out into Arabian desert, and there Jesus, Jesus himself instructed and taught Paul, and he taught him and gave him the gospel. And he gave to Paul not only the gospel, but he gave him the doctrine of grace, the grace of God. And by the way, aren't you thankful for God's grace? That it is not works, that we don't have to earn God's favor, that it is that of grace, that it is something we do not deserve, but yet God loves us. And so Paul was trained, Paul comes back, and immediately Paul begins to preach the gospel. Paul begins to preach grace, but he is greatly persecuted because he is a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, some would say, well, it's easy for Paul because Paul was an apostle. Paul was trained by Christ. And, and, and you know, Paul was, was a man of God and he had it easy. And it's easy for that man of God to have joy. It's kind of funny because over the years I've had people say some of the silliest things. I've had people say, oh, well, you know, y you must be so lucky. You're a pastor. And when, when you become a pastor, man, just all your problems go away. I've had people almost say things like that. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the world? Oh, that's right. You didn't know that the day you get ordained, the day you go to get ordained, you know what happens? Kind of like Paul. There's this bubble that's placed around you and the devil can't even come near you. Did you know that? It's amazing. <laughs> so we're going to ordain all of you so you can have this little spiritual bubble that surrounds you and you're never going to have another problem again. That is as far from the truth as possible because it's interesting. You look at the life of Paul. Paul was a powerful man. Paul had great power. Paul was a wealthy man. Paul was a part of what's called the Sanhedrin within the Jewish culture. Paul was, think about this, he was able to put people in prison, remember? Paul was the one doing the persecuting. So Paul went from persecuting Christians to becoming a persecuted Christian, even after he was called to be an apostle. He was called to be an apostle to the Gentile nations. He wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. But yet what you'll find is look at the life and the ministry of Paul. And Paul 
faced all kinds of opposition, all kinds of struggle. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is this. It's because Paul talks about having joy. Paul talks about having the peace of God. And when you read the book of Philippians, the whole theme of the book of Philippians is having joy. The theme of the book of Philippians is having the peace of God in your life. Now, what's interesting is this. The circumstances that Paul was writing this letter is he's in prison. He is in jail. He is in prison. And by the way, it did not have all the modern amenities that the prisons and jails have today. Now, I am not making light of prison and jail. I have been there as a guest. Amen. <laughs> Just wanted to clarify that. I have been there to do prison ministry. Juvenile and, and going into prisons. I've been in, in I mean, high-level, high-security prisons where I have to admit, it gets pretty scary. You know, when you walk into a place where there's like five, six hundred men, many of them who have murdered people, you know, and then they have, they have biceps bigger than my waist. It can be terrifying. And you go in and you teach and you preach the word of God and you try to minister. And, and I don't want to make light of, of prison because it is a bad place and they're separated from their family. And it is. It's hard. It's a, it's, you know, it's a rough place. But I just want to help you understand that when you think about Paul being in prison, it did not have any modern amenities. I'm talking, listen, it was bad. Rats and and feces, and, 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 and it's dark. I mean, the, the, the dungeons, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, like what we think of as uh, of in the old primitive jails, this, that's what it was. And so Paul is in a really rough place. He's in a bad place. And why is he there? He's there because he loves Jesus, and he's preaching God's word, and he's sharing the, the love of God, and he gets put in prison. And so understand this, Paul's in prison. Paul is in, I mean, in a terrible place. He's, he's persecuted. The Bible talks about how he's beaten and he's whipped and he's been beaten with rods. And so even when he's in this prison, he's being persecuted. Paul goes in the book of Corinthians, he goes through and he talks about how five different times he's beaten with rods. Numerous times he was catty nine tailed whipped, whipped with, with, I mean, with, with uh, straps that have uh, leather and glass and, and, and bone ripping him, him to shreds. He had been shipwrecked and all of these things. And so Paul is in prison, most likely being spit upon every day and being tortured and being beaten and being persecuted. So picture this setting. And then Paul writes this book about having God's peace. And he writes this book about having joy. And I don't know about you, but when I read it, when I think about it, I get pretty convicted because there's times I don't really have joy like I should. And I think I had a bad day because maybe... The air conditioning wasn't working right. You know what I'm saying? Or I think I'm having a bad day because the person in front of me is just driving five miles below the speed limit. And I'm in a hurry. And I think I'm having a bad day. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we have to look at the perspective of where Paul is at. And Paul says, have joy. Brothers and sisters, he says, you can have joy. You can have peace. So he gives us Three quick thoughts, and, and I'm really going to focus in on one because I think it's so important. We'll focus in on verse 8, but I want to just throw out what he says, how you can have peace, how you can have joy in the midst of any circumstance. Because he says, listen, he says, don't be anxious. He says, and in, in, in every situation, he says, pray. So the first thing you say, when, when I'm starting to feel anxiety come upon me, when I feel like stress is starting to take over me, the first thing he says is to pray promptly or to pray right. There's basically the idea is this. There's three things. He says you need to pray right. In verse 6 and 7, he says immediately pray. He says you need to think right. That's the one we're going to focus on in just a minute. He says you need to think right. He says you need to pray right. You need to think right. And then he says you need to do right. Or we could say it like this. He says, when you feel anxious, when you feel stress starting to come into your life, and it feels like it's starting to overcome you, he says, the first thing you need to do is pray promptly. Immediately pray. I remember when we got the phone call. Good morning, buddy. How you doing? <laughs> I remember when we got the phone call. The baby came a week early. And I remember immediately stress starts hitting me. We get a call at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 
At 4 o'clock in the morning, the, the birth mom calls and says, the baby's born, and immediately, I'm like, I jump up. The first words I hear is, he's doing fine. My wife says, he's doing fine. I'm like, whoa, it's a boy. I have to admit. I'm like, we already have a lot of girls in the house. I was being overrun. And my, my only son at the time, he's, he's moving out. So I'm going to be overrun by girls. I need another guy in the house. I need some help here, you know. And so I was excited. But then I'm like, oh, man. Now we've got to try to figure out who's going to come and watch the kids. We've got to get plane tickets. We've got to do all. And I have to admit, immediately stress hits me. Anxiety hits me. How are we going to work this out? And then I just need to get there. I need, and then I need to try to have a rental car. And I already had all these things reserved. And so I have to call Expedia. And then I've got to call uh, Southwest Air. And we've got to change everything. And, we, and immediately, I have to admit, my wife and I are running around. And we're doing this. And we're going all these places. We're getting nothing done. I'm like, we just got to pray. And so I remember stopping. I'm like, I should have did this the first, you know, like 15 minutes ago. But pray. When you feel stress, when you feel that anxiety, when you feel it starting to hit you, and it starts to rob you of your joy, and it can happen. We've all been there, right? Paul says, in every situation, pray. He says, let you just bring it to God. And you know, how many times have we said this? And I have to admit, I confess, there's times I've said, we'll say something like this. Well, all we can do now is pray. How many of you have said something like that? Let's be honest. You know, the fact of the matter is that's the best thing that we can do. And so many times it ends up being our last resort when it should be our first resort. That should be the first thing that we do immediately when, when all of a sudden everything starts to happen immediately Pray right. Pray promptly. Immediately start praying. Say, okay, this crazy thing happened. Let's stop. Before we do anything else, let's pray. For example, how many of you remember this one? If there's a fire when you're a kid, stop, drop, and roll. How many of you remember that one, right? You know, I'm glad I've never had to use that one. But right, stop, drop, and roll. But you know what? We could learn something like that uh, along the same lines. In our lives... When things hit us, when things happen, things that are unexpected, and, you know, the idea is when there's an emergency, we need to stop. We need to stop what we're doing. We need to pray right away. All right. So there's stop, drop, and roll, right? Spiritually speaking, stop and pray. Pray right away. Pray right away. First thing, he says, you have this come upon you, stop and pray. Immediately pray promptly. Second thing he says is think right or think positively. That's the one we'll focus on in just a moment. And then the third thing he says, if, if you will, is he says do right or obey passionately. Because notice what he says, the things which you have learned in verse 9, and he says, and received and you have heard in me. He says, you know, do, put it to practice. So practice obedience. So the first thing we do is what? Pray right. The second thing we need to do is think right. The third thing we need to do is do right or to, if you will, to practice what we already know we need to do. Practice obedience. But I want to focus in on just for a few moments on this thought of thinking right. To think right. In verse number eight, notice what he says. He says, this is part of having the joy of God in your life. This is how you can have the peace of God. He says, so how do you have the peace of God? You need immediately when things hit you, you need to stop. You need to pray. And it's interesting when you pray, pray with thanksgiving. But then he says you need to think positively. Now, I'm not trying to, to you know, to try to get all psycho uh, and psychoanalyze and, and use psychology. But the fact of the matter is there is power in positive thinking. There is. There is power in that. You say, well, where do you get that? It's not from a psychologist. I get it from the Bible. In fact, one man wisely said that the book of Philippians is the psychology book of the Bible. And there is something about that because he talks about how we think and the mind. And the mind is, is, is a very powerful thing. In fact, I believe that most of spiritual warfare takes place in the mind. That's why the Bible says you need to take captive every thought. And so the idea is this. Paul says you need to take, take captive every thought that is an enemy of Christ, an enemy of truth, and the enemy of the Word of God. Let's be honest. 
We all know this to be true because how many times when we struggle with things or maybe we're tempted, there's this battle going on where? In our mind. Should I do this or shouldn't I do this? Boy, I really feel like doing this. And there's this battle that goes on. There's that warfare. And where is that battle taking place? It's in our mind. And so Paul says that there's power in, in thinking positive thoughts. He says in verse 8, notice he says you need to be thinking right. He says, brethren, he says what, what, if things are true, if they're honest, notice this long list, if they're just, Pure, things that are lovely. Think about those things. If you can find any kind of virtue or any type of praise, those are the things you need to be thinking on. So you need to be thinking right. Let me try an illustration once. You ready? It's not too hard. No right or wrong question, but let me just hold this up just for a moment. Everybody look at this. What do you see? Go ahead, say it. Okay. That's what you see. What color is that dot? Okay, that's what you see? See a black dot. Now, a couple thoughts about, we'll get to that in just a second. Like, what was that? How many of you ever heard this phrase, stinking thinking? You ever hear that? It's a good, catchy little phrase. My dad always used to say that to me. There's times I'd be like, well, I just can't. He'd say, don't say that word. Don't say can't. That's what you'd say. Don't say can't. And then my dad would say this. He'd say, that's stinking thinking. Son, you need to quit that stinking thinking. And he would really preach that to us. By the way, my dad was a preacher. So I grew up hearing. And he'd say, quit that stinking thinking. That's stinking thinking. You can't think like that. And then he'd say, and it's funny because it's just a few verses later. He says, you need to say, I can. In fact, the Bible says, and here it is, in that very same chapter, verse 13, Paul says, here's the power of, of again, positive thinking. Of course, through Christ, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can. I can. I can. And my dad used to say, you need to get yourself a can opener. And you need to say, I can, you know. And he, my dad had all these crazy little sayings, you know. Like, for example, he had this saying, he'd say, use, use your head. It's the little things that count, you know, or use your brain. He'd, he'd say, use your brain. It's the little things that count. And he would just really, you know, just little digs and little ways to get you to think. But he, when you'd say, I can't, he'd say, yes, you can. And don't you say you can't. And, and so here's the idea is this, is that stinking thinking is a bad thing. And it gets the best of a lot of us. It really does. Stinking thinking is a disease. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? It's part of the fall of man. It's a part of our sin nature. Part of our sin nature is that we, we not even whether we're thinking it, and it's not intentional, but we do have a tendency to be critical. To always seem to find the fault or the flaw. For example, when we hold up this piece of paper, it's just our nature. Our nature is when we hold this up and I say, what do we see? You know what we focus on? We focus on the one little black dot. But what we don't say is, boy, I see a whole lot of white paper up there. Am I right? My wife will say something like this. My wife will try something on. And it looks great. It looks fabulous. She'll try something on. And this is me because I'm really bad about this. She'll put it on and she'll say, how does this look? And you know what? There'll be a little piece of lint like right here or a little piece of fuzz. And I have to go up and go like this and pick it off. And she's like, well, how does it look? I don't know. All I see is that piece of lint right there. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? You'll see somebody in an outfit and you'll see like a big long piece of hair hang up. That's all you see. Right? We, we all know this. That's, that's our nature. Isn't it interesting, our nature? Is that they can have this whole, it's, it's like the piece of paper. There's this whole piece of paper and it's all white. It's clean and crisp and white. But what is our nature? Our nature is to focus in on the one flaw that's on the piece of paper. Am I right? Because that's our nature. Our nature is to find fault to find flaws. Our nature is to critique and to be critical. Whether we like that or not, that is our nature. It's part of the fall of man. 
And so Paul, it's interesting, he says, if you will, he, the idea is, he says, you have to train yourself to quit that stinking thinking. Because our nature is to be negative. It is to be critical. And it, oftentimes it's not even intentional. That's just who we are. That's the way that we are. I mean, everything can, you know, a person can get up and they can sing a beautiful song and make one little mistake. And the only part that we remember is, yeah, well, they made a mistake. Come on now. Our kids make a bed or they clean the room. And I have to work on this, you know, having young ones. And we have such high expectations. And there's time to say, go clean your room. You go in. And honestly, they did a pretty good job. But we'll find one thing, you know, sticking out. And we'll go in and be like, look at this. And we pick it up. You know, look at that. But they did do a pretty good job with the rest of the room. Come on now. I know I'm preaching. Aren't you glad the younger ones are in the other room? <laughs> Yeah, the teen, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, he just got the look from a teenager. But that's our nature. But yet the kids do the same thing. You know, oh, my parents, they never let me do anything. But we feed them and we clothe them and we give them money. We run them all over creation. You know, we drive all over and then, our, we, then we say no one time. No, you're, no, listen, you cannot hang out off a 40-story building with your friends. You can't do that. You know, I'm, not, I'm putting my foot down. I'm not going to, oh, my dad, my mom, they're so hard. They're just, oh, they're so cruel. My parents, they hate me. No, if we hated you, we'd let you hang off the 40-story building. Come on now. But that's our nature. That's the way we are. Because we're fallen. We're sinful. By the way, that's, aren't you thankful for Jesus? And we need a Savior. Aren't you thankful that in spite of our flaws, in spite of, in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of all of our failures, that Christ still loved us and he still died for us. And that God loved us so much that he sent his son. In spite of all of our failures and flaws and our sinful nature, but our nature is to be critical. Reminds me of two men who were hunting partners. And they would love to duck hunt. And they would go duck hunting. And, and so one of them said, you know, I'm going to buy us a dog. Because we have to keep getting out. And there's times we, we can't get out there to where the ducks are. And if we shoot them, they fall. And, and then we have a, it's such a pain. He says, you know, I'm going to get a dog. And I'm going to get the best dog that there is. Now, his hunting partner was just one of those, well, good luck with that. Yeah, we'll see. He was just, uh, I mean, he was just critical. So the guy spent some big money and got a dog. And then not only did he get a good dog, but he had it professionally trained. The dog was so well trained, you won't believe this, but the dog could run on top of the water. Yeah, it was amazing. So they go out to go hunting, and his friend, who's real critical, says, that's the most ugly-looking hunting dog I've ever seen. He says, but just wait till you see it in action. This dog is amazing. He says, you just wait. He says, you wait. He says, and he's not, he's not gun-shy either. He says, when the ducks fly over, we start shooting. You'll see. He's not gun-shy. Not only that, this dog is amazing. He will run on top of the water, get the duck, and bring it back. And the guy says, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. That's the most mangiest-looking mud I've ever seen in my life. So sure enough, the ducks came in, and they started calling, and they started calling, and here comes the ducks, and they pull out the guns, and they start shooting, and the duck falls. And the dog just sat there waiting for the command of his master, and his master couldn't wait to show off. He couldn't wait. The dog didn't flinch when the guns went off. The dog didn't hide. Just sat right there next to him. And he looks to his buddy, and he says, hey, watch this. He says to the dog, he says, Fetch! And the dog runs out and it's running on top of the water. And it runs on top of the water. It doesn't even get wet. And it picks up the duck and it comes running back and it runs back and it brings the duck back and literally just sits, sits there. And the master takes the duck and holds it up. And he looks over to his friend and he says to his friend, Hey, what do you think about that? And the guy says, Well, shoot. That dog can't even swim. <laughs> you know, we have a tendency to be like that guy. Are you with me? That we always find the fault. 
We do it with our kids. We do it in our marriage. Sometimes we do it in church among our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have this disease, that, that, that critical nature. It's like a cancer that spreads. And, and here's the thing. It's not only is stinking thinking a disease, but stinking thinking can be destructive. It can be dangerous because that critical nature, it not only harms ourself, and it's not good for us. It robs us of our joy. It robs us of the peace of God. But what it can do is it also affects the people around us. If we're constantly negative, constantly critical, always pointing out flaws in other people, what happens is it begins to spread and other people begin to become the same way. And so it begins to, to drag everyone around them down. So we have to guard against this, not only as a church family, but in our own families, in our marriages. You know, let's be honest, the longer you're married, there's times where you can begin to see the negative things. You know, I get into the car and I find my wife's wrappers, her chocolate wrappers, and I have to admit, I get them like, duh, what's so hard about throwing away a wrapper? And then the Holy Spirit's like, well, if it's not so hard, then what are you complaining about it for? <laughs> you can do it. And I'm like, Holy Spirit, will you be quiet, please? <laughs> but I do. I'll get in like, oh, here we go. I just cleaned this car, and there's wrappers everywhere. Or I go to get in the car, and the seat's pushed all the way up to the steering wheel, and I'm thinking, how in the world? And I can't get into the thing, you know? Come on now. <laughs> Come on. You know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, what's so hard about moving the seat back? And then the Holy Spirit says, yeah, what's so hard about it? Shut your mouth and move the seat back. But we always find these little negative things. And, you know, that's, and let's, let's be honest. When you're married and the longer you're married, you start to see this, you see that. And we begin to see these and we can become very critical. And by the way, if we're not careful, our kids can catch on to that. And before long, they have this critical spirit and negative. And, and then when mom tries to say something, they're critical because they hear us critical. I'm just, hey, I know I'm, I know I'm meddling a little bit, but the fact is, I'm being human. I'm saying I'm just as guilty that I have to guard against this stinking thinking. Because stinking thinking is destructive. Stinking thinking oftentimes creates problems when there are no problems. Stinking thinking is destructive because there's times maybe someone does something or maybe someone says something and it's not even intentional and there was nothing really meant. But our stinking thinking, our brain, our mind begins to analyze and maybe they say something and we begin to psychoanalyze it. We begin to say, is that really what they meant? Well, oh, and before long, we have them out to be a horrible person and we thought all of these horrible things and they had no intention of that. Come on now. I'll give you an example. We won't turn there, but in history, in biblical history, in 2 Samuel chapter 10, this is interesting. David is the king. David has become king, and he's been king for a while, and there was another king, the king of Ammon, which is basically Jordan. How many of you know the uh, capital of Jordan is, uh, is Ammon, Jordan? The descendants of, of the Ammonites, Ammon, where their capital was, is the city of Ammon, Jordan. That's where we get the name Am Ammon, or the Ammonites. There was a king named Nahash. King Nahash was actually kind to David. When David was running from Saul, Saul could go, uh, I mean, uh, Saul was chasing David. David had nowhere to go. And David says that King Nahash was kind to him. He gave him a place where he could have basically a, a safe haven. And so what happens is the king dies. And so when the king dies, his son takes over in the land of the Ammonites, and their capital city is Ammon, Ammon, Jordan, a very fortified city. Long story short, he takes over, and David says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, because, because this new king's father showed kindness to me, I want to be kind to him. So I'm going to send the, uh, uh, basically an entourage, if you will, of 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 leaders from our country, from Israel, to go as comforters and to let them know that we're sorry for their loss. And so he sends a group of, of grieving men, basically, men to come and to share condolences as a, a gesture from King David. So David sends a group of men, a group of his uh, leaders, to the land of, of today, Jordan, to the capital, to Amman, Jordan. 
And he sends them there and, and they go and they come and they say, David sends his regards. David, David wants you to know that he is sorry for your loss and that, that he greatly respected your father who was the previous king and that he was a good man and that he was kind to David and so he's sending his regards. So the, the king's son, as he's sitting there at first, he's, he's like, okay, this is great. Wow, wonderful, thank you. But a group of guys sitting there, a group of the princes, says to the king, they say to the king, do you really think that that's why he sent them here? Is this why he really sent them here? So he says, they say to the king, they say, they've come to spy out the land. They've come to spy, and they're not here for good reasons. They've come to spy out the land, and they're going to try to take us over. So they insult them. The Bible says he cuts off, they cut off half their beards. They cut off half their clothes. They insult them. Basically, it was like an act of war, and they send them back. They come back to David, and David's like, this is how they're going to treat us? We send a group of men over. This is an act of war. You know what David does? David sends Joab. And he says, go to war. Get over there and you let them know we're not going to mess around. We're not going to play games. David did not play games. We know that. So Joab goes and takes a group of soldiers. Well, now what happens is Ammon says, we need help. And so they call upon the Syrians and they pay a large army. And a long story short, Joab, when he shows up, he goes to, to the capital, Ammon, Jordan. He goes to the capital. And when they're getting ready to go fight, all of a sudden from behind them, now they're surrounded. Now from behind them comes the Syrians because they were a paid army that, that, the, that basically now Jordan, present day Jordan, Ammon, basically the Ammonites paid them. So Joab's now caught between the middle, and Joab says, all right, he tells his brother, you go after the city, we're going to take the mighty men, we're going to go back, and if I need help, you, uh, you know, you help me if you need help, and anyway, there's a victory, a good victory. They go back to David, and David says, that's it, that's all, now, it's, now the big guns. David basically rolls up his sleeves. David says, I'm not only sending you, I'm coming with you. Now, when David comes to battle, you better watch out. And so David comes to battle. You say, why are you telling us this story? David comes to battle, and first of all, he says, the Syrians, we're going to take care of you. They kill in one battle almost 41,000 Syrians. After they kill the Syrians, they basically go to the city gate, and I'm just kind of putting it in terms. He basically says, right now is not the time for war. Probably winter was coming. He says, but we will be back. And what you'll find as you study history, they go home for a short respite. Most likely it's winter time, not a good time to go to war. David regroups. The Syrians basically said, we will become your servants. The Syrians are now out of the picture. That weakens the Ammonites. And then David, when the time when kings go forth to battle, 2 Samuel 11, he basically surrounds and they surround that city and they put a, they put a halt to that city. Meaning that city is surrounded. They're now living like, like animals inside their own city. And here's the point. That we know of 41,000 people lost their lives. Probably many more. Remember Uriah the Hittite? Bathsheba's husband? He died at the city gate. Remember? Where did he die? At the city gate of Ammon. Ammon, Jordan. Here's what I'm trying to emphasize, and that is this. It's a historical, if you will, event that illustrates stinking thinking. David sent men to comfort. David sent men to show that we, you know what, your father was a good man. But what happened? They took a good thing, they twisted it, and they said, they've come to spy out the land. And thousands and thousands of people lost their lives. Nations, three nations went to war. By the way, I could say this, that it's probably true that many a times that has happened in the history of the world. That wars over crazy 
twisted thinking. And you know something? Marriages, marriages have been destroyed. Wars have been fought. Homes have been torn apart. Why? Because stinking thinking is destructive. Kids run away from home because of stinking thinking. I hate to say this, but there have been times over the years where I have performed funerals of people who have taken their own lives. Young fathers. Try not to be too graphic. But I remember one of the young men, his kids are out on a swing set and he literally hangs himself while his little kids are on a swing, swing set. You say, what causes a person to do that? Stinking thinking. What causes people to harm themselves, to hurt themselves, to many a times do things that they, you would say they wouldn't normally do. You know what it is? It's called stinking thinking. It's destructive. Paul says if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, find the good thing to think about. In any circumstance, in any situation, Paul's in prison, but Paul found a way to keep his eyes upon Jesus Christ and to find that which is praiseworthy. Amen? And even though he's in prison, even though it was horrible circumstances, he still had joy, he still had the peace of God because he prayed, and because here, he says, I had to learn, I had to train myself to think properly, to have the right perspective. And may I say this, that is so important. It reminds me of the man who fell off the Empire State Building. He fell off the Empire State Building near the top. One witness says as he passed the fifth floor, they heard him yell, so far, so good. <laughs> he was the optimist, amen. <laughs> There's something about being optimistic. I remember years ago, it's been almost 17 years ago or so, went and visited Columbia, Missouri. We went there. There was a group of, small group of people that said, we need a pastor. And we've had four or five guys in the last number of months come through. And they, you know, we've asked them to come and if they'd be willing to take our church. And, and they said this, they said, they, one said that the church, the, the, the city is too transient, too many people come and go. It's a college town, you can't do it. Another one said, well, it's too small, it's going to take, take too much work. And another one said, well, the property and the building and the location, it's just not going to work. It's dilapidated. These were the things that pastors were saying as they were coming. I came, and I have to admit, I saw five acres of land. I saw a great big building that, yeah, needed lots of work, but I saw a building that we could fill with, with people as we share the good news of Jesus Christ. I saw a town like Columbia, Missouri as a mission field that, yes, it's transient, but as people come and go, if they get Jesus, they take Jesus with them, and now we're a mission field. Now we're taking people all around the country and all around the world. And the, the fact of the matter is when I went, I saw opportunity. I saw, like, hey, we could do something here. With God, all things are possible. And my point, I'm just simply saying, is this. It's all how you view things. You know, we've all heard the saying, the glass is either half full or half empty. And Paul really drives home this point, to think, to think properly, to think right. There's power in that. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on those things. And lastly, I want you to see that stinking thinking is deliverable. It's deliverable. That we can train ourselves, train ourselves, literally, to think Positively, to say, you know what, I'm not going to look at the negative in this. Look at the positive. Find ways to find the positive. Find ways to see that, hey, this isn't a bad thing. Maybe God has something else in store. Amen? You know, there's lots of people that, you know, 
in their life, they're always finding the negative. We have to reprogram the way we think. You know, in our marriage, instead of always finding the negative, find the positive. The positive thing is, hey, they actually put up with you. That's positive. Come on now. Right? They put up with me. Whatever it may be, but finding the positive. Because Paul says if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on those things. And you know what? Whether it's in your church, at your job, at your work, the fact that, you know, you get into your car and you say, oh, this car, it's an old hunk of junk, but be thankful that you're not walking. Amen? There's always something. You know, it's like the, the man who who had a, a bad ankle and twisted his ankle and was starting to complain until he saw one who had no leg. You know, it, there's some truth to that. That we, we realize that Paul says there's power. There's power in this. And so my challenge this morning is this. As Paul says in every circumstance, in every circumstance, don't let stress, don't let anxiety. And that's easy to say. Come on, I know that. That's easy to say. But the first thing you do when you feel that anxiousness come upon you, when you feel the stress creeping on, what do you do? First thing, stop and what? Pray. 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 Stop immediately. Pray. It's going to happen this week. Something's going to hit you. Something's going to come at you. Something's going to happen. And what do you do? You need to immediately pray promptly. Pray right away. Secondly, you need to think positively. Amen? All right. I'm, going to, I'm not going to let, I'm not going to let that stinking thinking destroy me. I'm not going to think the worst. I'm not, listen, I'm trying to train myself to give people the benefit of the doubt. To always try to give someone the benefit of that. By the way, wouldn't you want someone to do the same for you? I know I would. And then he says these things do. Put it to practice. The hardest thing in the Christian life is to do what we already know we're supposed to do. We know we're supposed to pray. We know that when things hit us, we're supposed to pray. But sometimes, let's be honest, we put it off. Or we say, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to do this. We try to do it on our own. Pray. Pray. Put these things. Paul says, put them to practice. Put the things that you know you should be doing to practice. And he says, if you do it, he says, you'll have joy. Amen? If you do it, you'll have the peace of God. The peace of God that passes all understanding. And by the way, what a testimony that is. When people are around to say, man, how, do you, how are you doing it? I see this going on in your life. How, how do you have such a... How, how do you do it? And you can just say, you know what? Praise the Lord. I prayed and I asked God to help me. I asked God to give me the wisdom. And I tried to, to, you know, find the positive and let the Holy Spirit encourage me. And you know what? God then gets the glory. Amen? And it's a way that we can be a testimony. It's a way that we can be a witness. It's a way that we can be a light to this world that we're living in. And all God's people said this morning. Amen. Let's stand and have a word of prayer.